coming. It's a great, great turnout. Um, all right, so my talk tonight is about, um, about licensing. Um, this is a business case for the LGPL. If any of you don't know what that acronym stands for, it's the Lesser GNU Public License. Um, now, now this, is, this is actually a really interesting topic, and it, certainly a very important topic. Um, whether I manage to make it an interesting topic in my presentation um, uh, remains to be seen. Um, if I don't, um, please don't let that lead you to the conclusion this is not an interesting topic, because it actually is. Um, okay, so I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna divide this into three sections. I'm gonna, first kind of overview of what is open source. It's gonna be redundant for a lot of you, but, but not for everybody. Um, I think it'd be helpful to kind of give a bit of context. Um, uh, why open source? Um, this is where the kind of the meat of uh, the argument is. And then the open source licenses in the case for LGPL. So um, uh, the, 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 the essence of the argument I'm gonna make today is, um, is making a case for a certain class of uh, open source license. And it's something of a, um, uh, of a contrarian, um, uh, contrarian argument. Um, and uh, uh, toward the end of the um, presentation, uh, hopefully um, you'll be able to see the relevance of the argument to, to the EEA. Okay, so first, um, you know, what, what, what is open source? Um, now, when I put these slides together, I, I didn't kind of appreciate the, the, the irony of giving an open source presentation and discussing free as in freedom rather than free as in free beer when I run the company that actually paid for the beer tonight. Um, but uh, um, the, this, the, this is said often in the open source community is like that open source is about free as in, as in freedom or free as in free speech, not free as in free beer. And uh, um, nonetheless, the confusion still sort of, sort of reigns, um, particularly on the, not so much with technologists, but on the business side. Um, and it, it's partly justified the confusion because it's not just ignorance on the part of business people, it is also um, uh, an economic issue. And arguably, I, I would argue that, that, that open source does have a, a free rider issue. Um, it's not really a problem or at least it's not a problem today. Um, but I'd suggest that um, it could become a problem, and particularly as technology moves into the direction of, uh, of, 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 dis of distributed state, networks of distributed state, the type of technology infrastructure that we need um, is going to create a different pattern of investment into infrastructure technology, and the licensing issue is gonna become more important. Um, okay, so I'm gonna run through these pretty quickly. Um, uh, um, you know, what is open source? According to the Open Source Institute, generally open source software can be software that is freely accessible, used, changed, and shared in modified or unmodified form by anyone. Um, open source software is made by many people and distributed under licenses that comply with the open source definition. So what is the open source definition? Well, there are, 10, there are 10 points. I'm not gonna go through all of them. Um, the, 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 the top three are, 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 are the sort of the essence um, of, of, of open source. Um, first, um, free redistribution. Um, the license shall not restrict any party from selling or giving away the software as a component of an aggregated software distribution containing programs from several different sources. The license shall not require a royalty or other fee for such sale. Um, so um, what, what I'm going to talk about in the talk here is this, this, this idea of a, a, a software system that is an aggregation of multiple projects and multiple um, code bases. Um, and the idea that part of the essence of open source is that if such an aggregated system contains some proprietary components and some open source components, that the that the open source components remain open source and that the distribution is, uh, remains free um, despite the fact that it's commingled with, uh, with other stuff. Um, source code, the program must include source code and must allow distribution, this kind of, kind of follows from the very word open source, obviously. Um, and, and derived works, um, the license must allow for modifications and derived works and must allow them to be distributed under the same terms as the license of the original software. And this is a really important aspect of open source because software is a living thing and, um, and open source software is a living thing. It tends to um, evolve in directions that aren't foreseeable at the beginning and not necessarily under the control of the original originators of the project. It forks, it 
merges with other projects. Um, the, the, the derivative nature of, of open source is, 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 is essential to, um, to the concept. Um, so why, why open source and why, why does open source software matter? Um, this, people have different opinions on this. Um, uh, I, I, I really like this, um, uh, uh, this quote from Eric Raymond in a talk that he gave a few years ago. So human beings are really good at building complex systems that have lots of errors in them. Errors in complex systems created by human beings typically, typically cannot be detected mechanically. There is no decision procedure that can be applied to a software program that says this is a bad software design. Some of you know about this. It's called the halting problem. Uh, that means the only hedge we have against systemic failure in complex systems is peer review by human eyeballs. If you keep secrets, you are cutting your own throat. That is the lesson of open source. A bit dramatic ending of that. Um, but, um, and I would take issue that the, that the peer review by human eyeballs, which is the essence of open source, is, is the only hedge. I think it's, I think it's a necessary condition, um, uh, but probably not a sufficient condition. But nonetheless, this is um, this this argument. I think is uh, dare I say the, amongst the technical community the the, the, the consensus about um, uh, the value of open source, and it becomes more valuable the lower level you get into the software stack. And when you're talking about infrastructure, <clears throat> particularly when you're talking about infrastructure, distributed infrastructure, in a world where we have you know. Uh, software running in programmable device controllers that control power stations and automated drones and you know dangerous software um, that the the peer review by human eyeballs um, is a crucial um, aspect of guarding against the inevitable errors that uh, uh, humans will um, uh, put into complex systems um, so what is the value of open source? This kind of depends on your perspective. Um, the, the quote that I gave from Eric Raymond um, is one that's not very controversial from, from the developer community. Um, uh, there's also the perspective of technology companies and technology suppliers. Um, and I have a different view of this. Um, and then enterprise financial users, I'm focusing on the, the, the financial vertical because that's what we focus on um, and it's, but central to the EEA, um, and financial regulators. And it's, it's these two parties that I, I'm kind of focusing the argument of the, uh, um, for LGPL um, uh, with the, the perspective of these two parties in, uh, in, in mind. So it's a sort of fresh perspective on the topic because uh, open source licensing is not exactly something um, you, you hear discussed on, on, on Bloomberg TV. Um, uh, it's, a, it's a pretty niche topic, um, uh, um, uh, monopolized by, by technologists. So um, it's useful to look at it from the perspective of these guys. So let's look at the kind of regulator's perspective on, on you know, the, the, the space and ask um, how open source um, it's relevant to, to open source. Um, so this is a, this is a paper um, by um, uh, a Bank of England working paper that was published a, a few months ago, um, definitely worth reading, The Economics of Distributed Ledger <laughs> Technology for security settlement of no small relevance to uh, our work at Clearmatics and what many people are doing in, in the EEA. Now, what is um, in, um, developing new technological know-how, whether it's DLT or not, with the aim of modernizing security settlement is akin to adding to a public good. For this reason, it is best if research and investment is done in a cooperative rather than competitive manner, which implies that public authorities and regulators can play an important role in facilitating such a cooperative outcome. Um, so, okay, so this idea of, um, of, uh, um, of, of, of development of these systems being a, um, akin to adding to a public good, um, this is, well, free and open source software is, is, is a public good that's kind of obvious. Um, uh, the type of licensing um, uh, um, that goes in, the type of false licensing, um, matters a lot uh, when you view um, these these systems as as public goods because public goods tend to uh, um, tend to have uh, free rider problems and under investment um, as 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 a result of that. Um, so uh, so that's an interesting question to ask as to um, uh, what type of open source what does an open source license have to say about um, under investment in the public goods, and this is kind of if best of research and 
investment is done in a cooperative rather than competitive manner. Now, uh, this is kind of the point um, that's being made by the authors of the Bank of England paper. And given that they're economists, they, they look at the problem in a certain way. And they're looking at the problem as, well, if it's a public good, it's gonna, it's gonna be un under investment into that public good. So, um, you know, the, the, the government should get involved um, and, uh, um, and, and the investment should be done in a public sector mindset, probably with public money, um, uh, perhaps sort of prodding the private sector to pour money into um, uh, utility structures. And, um, <clears throat> and it's, it's worth asking the question, does, does that actually follow from the conclusion that these systems are public goods and that um, open source software um, is a public good? Um, I mean, it suggests that, that, that it doesn't necessarily follow, because uh, I s actually see this space as being dominated and will be dominated by private sector investment. Um, and how private sector investment um, monetizes open source is a, is a, is a, is a crucial question. And, and I, I, would, I would say that this research and investment they're referring to, um, we should probably describe as uh, co-opetition uh, rather than uh, the, uh, the, the cooperative end of a, of a dichotomy. Um, and then here's the crucial question, is there an incentive to invest in free and open source software? Okay, um, so uh, uh, this is a little illustration. Um, just put a, a visual behind. What is it? It's actually, in essence, a, a simple point, um, but, I, but I think it's, 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 it's forgotten. So like the, the black dots up there, this is a, an open source um, uh, project. An open source being, you know, a, a open source code base being a, being a living thing rather than a static thing, it goes through, through, through versions. Um, uh, so uh, the, the red dots down there at the bottom, this is, a, this, this is the hypothetical private sector um, uh, institution or, or consortium of institutions um, that has a need for a feature that's not, not in that open source code base. Um, and, and the idea is we want to we look at this problem not from the ideological perspective of it's good to contribute to open source because of all these wonderful reasons about you know, freedom, um, but rather purely a commercial incentive. Uh, the guys, you know, red dots down there, um, uh, he, he doesn't care about the community, um, what, what's, what's economically valuable to him. Um, so he looks at this problem, he's like, okay, um, so uh, uh, the, the feature that I want, you know, it's gonna cost 100, 100,000 pounds or whatever uh, in order to implement the feature, um, but it's worth like, you know, 10 million bucks to me, so I, I'm definitely gonna like spend the money to, to build that feature because, but given that I don't really give a shit about the community, um, uh, I'm not thinking about whether I should contribute that back into the, into the, into the code base. So I'm gonna keep that, that fork, that feature that I've developed privately, invested into, I'm gonna keep it, keep it private. Um, but the implications of keeping that private, because software is a living thing, is that every time uh, the, there's a new release on, on the open source code base, he's gonna have to rebase to that. And every time he rebases that, it introduces new complexity, it introduces cost. So, what the what the this this hypothetical private sector you know entity is is looking at here is not just the the outlay of development cost into implementing the feature, but the cost of maintaining the bloody thing after every mainline release in the open source project, and that cost gets higher um, the more out of date his um, uh, his private his private fork is. So the cost that this guy is facing is the initial outlay um, plus the cost of rebasing to the mainline open source project in, in perpetuity. So I'd like to suggest that, the, that, that from purely selfish, economically rational point of view, the guy should actually contribute the feature that he paid um, back, into, uh, uh, back into the open source project. Because if he does that, um, he still has the initial 100,000 pound capital outlay, um, but once he pushes it back into the main line, he doesn't have to maintain that thing. He's not, ma he's not maintaining a complicated software project that has to be frequently rebased. So the actual cost of, of doing that is different. So unless there is a compelling reason for not having that feature be available, you know, perhaps it gives a, an edge over your competitors or something, unless that, that property exists, it, it economically makes sense for private sector investment to go into, um, into free and open source software. However, there's a caveat, and this comes to, 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 to the licensing, licensing question. Um, but just this summary of the argument, as I think it's, 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 it's quite simple. I, I think it's correct, but I'd be curious to know what others think. Um, if the benefit of the feature is greater than the cost of its development, it's worth investing in the development of the feature. That's kind of no shit. Um, 
if the total cost of ownership of a private fork of a FOSS project exceeds the cost of contributing to the, uh, your future to the project, um, the investment in FOSS development is, economic, uh, is economically rational. So what does this mean for um, uh, um, open, source, open source licenses and, uh, and, and, the, and the LGPL? Um, so this is simple schematic of, of the sort of space of software licenses. On the right, you have the proprietary licenses. On the left, we've got public domain, we'll ignore that. Um, it's these two categories of copyleft and permissive licensing. And um, the LGPL and the GPL are the, the, the copyleft flavor, and there's another very popular flavor of licensing which we'll, um, we'll call permissive. Okay, so the, so the copy left is, is like, like, I have to put up a picture of this guy, Richard Stallman, because um, he's like the, the inventor of, of the, the GNU public license, um, the GPL. Um, and there he is, kind of like a, like a sort of software Jesus figure. Um, and then we have, um, so, so, so that's copy left. Uh, uh, Richard Stallman software, Jesus, is copy left. And then we have um, uh, permissive um, licenses, and that's, um, th th this, this is, the, this is the, the logo of the, of the, 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 the free BSD project. Um, and BSD uh, and MIT, these are, these are two very popular licenses that fall in the, in the, in the permissive category. Um, <clears throat> and the BSD demon there, he's wearing a, a business suit, um, talking on a mobile phone, kind of like a, like a like a Gordon Gecko character, because because the if the, the 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 consensus in the business community when they talk about open source is well, you know, what kind of licensing should we have, we should have permissive licensing or GPL? Well, no, no, not not GPL. Uh, it has to be a permissive license like like BSD. That's that's the that's the consensus in in the enterprise space. So that's that's why he's he's wearing a business suit. Um, <clears throat> uh, just a. A uh, little interlude um, uh, in terms of operating systems. Uh, uh, there, the, the licensing question in open source kind of maps on to a, like a, a, a long-standing friendly rivalry between two flavors of, of Unix. Uh, one's Linux on the left-hand side, cuddly penguin, um, and, and he's, he's copy left. And then there, there's the free BSD flavor of Unix, and, and he's, uh, he's, he's not evil. but. Um, uh, they're, they're, they work together nicely in the open source world. Um, so <clears throat> the difference is uh, in terms of these two licensing, what, what, uh, what matters? We can see that it's really the, the right to copy, modify, and distribute are the main distinguishing factors between open source and proprietary licenses. Uh, and the permissives and copy left licenses are pretty much the same sort of features in, uh, in, in terms of, of, of what they what they provide the community and, and, and the commercial space. But it's this, it's this right to distribute is the main distinguishing feature between the, the, the permissive and, and, and the copy left. Um, <clears throat> uh, so let's, let's look at what the, what, what, what the distinguishing features between these two are. Um, uh, first of all, uh, here's the free BSD license. Um, it's 226 words, including the, uh, the, the warranty disclaimer, which is not included on the slide. Very short and succinct. Um, it, it basically kind of says um, uh, you can do whatever you want with source code. Uh, all you have to do is like mention that it's uh, it's covered by this license, and that's it. That does, doesn't matter. You can include it in whatever project you want. You can put it into a proprietary software project and ship binary onlys and sell it. Um, uh, it doesn't matter. You can do whatever you want. Uh, that's why it's called permissive. <clears throat> um, it's a GPL um, license. So this is the copy left version. Uh, it's a lot longer. It's almost 3,000 words. And the, 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 the later version, um, uh, version 3, is like almost 6,000 words. Um, uh, so I'm not going to summarize that. But th this, this is the essence of it, which is this, this, this viral clause. And it's like, you must cause any work that you distribute or publish um, that in the whole or in part contains or is derived from the program or any part thereof to be licensed as a whole at no charge to all third parties, blah, 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 blah. Um, and and what, what, this, what this viral clause means is that if your um, GPL of open source license um, gets kind of merged, com combined with a, um, a software project that's under some other license, it too becomes GPL. And then this, kind of going back to the, to the, to the, to, to the demon in the business suit, um, is, is one of the reasons that it freaks out the enterprise space, that they don't want to 
touch anything that has to do um, with, with GPL. But I want to kind of soften the edge of this a bit um, and, and analyze it a little bit more as to like, like what's good about the viral property. And then we're going to address like what's bad about it. Um, what's good about it is, <clears throat> and this is from a business perspective, is that there's no risk that your investment in a, in a GPL project um, uh, um, bootstraps a proprietary version based on it. And the reason why this is, this, 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 is a, this is a risk is that the proprietary version could indirectly drain investment and user base from the free and open source project. So if you imagine the future state where there's a lot of um, uh, corporate investment into a common uh, um, uh, open source code base, um, the good outcome is that investment continues to go into that open source code base and we can all benefit from it and the critical mass that's behind that that false project just, just, just continues. The, um, the, the bad scenario is after the, 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 the code base has reached a certain level of maturity, um, it makes it a lot easier for a private company to come on and say, hey, that's great, but we're gonna put a lot of capital investment into adding new features that aren't currently in that open source project, um, uh, and, then, and we're, gonna take it, we're gonna take it private. And that, that that venture actually succeeds because they get a lot of capital investment behind it, and you would get a lot of capital investment behind it if you follow that business model because it's a natural monopoly. Um, so that's what's actually good about this viral property. Like this viral property uh, is, is, is something that going back to our original thesis that it is economically rational for enterprises to invest in open source software. One of the tacit assumptions that we're making is that this sort of viral property thing is actually at work. Whereas uh, having enterprise investment into permissive license software is actually more questionable from, from a, a self-interested, economically rational point of view. But what's bad about it? Well, what's bad about the GPL is it doesn't play nicely with proprietary software. Um, and that open source, you know, there shouldn't be fundamentalists and pluralism is good. Um, there's, there's a space for proprietary software and the open source software and the proprietary stuff should, should play together nicely. Um, <clears throat> sorry, that was, uh, this, that is um, an excessive concern for trademark infringement. Um, proprietary forks. Um, uh, I just wanted to mention the example of this uh, um, uh, um, real world example of liberal license um, being, uh, um, uh, um, being used by a um, commercial company to create a proprietary fork. So it's of course Apple and, um, and, and, and Apple um, uh, OS X uh, is based on uh, a, a fork of, uh, of, of free, free BSD. Um, very successful um, uh, um, operating system. Giving this talk on it now, um, and, and and probably and probably a, a good development. But um, but nonetheless, it's important to mention it because what I just described earlier about liberal license and liberal licenses and the enterprise investment is not just a, a theoretical point. Um, so uh, the the LGPL um, the LGPL is different from the GPL because it draws. Um, a distinction here between works based on the library and works that, that use the library. And this um, gives us the thing that we want, which is the viral property pertains to the, the, GP, the, the LGPL part of the program. Um, but it also gives confidence to enterprises investing in features that the project will not get forked by um, competing uh, proprietary project. And that's, that's great. Um, but uh, this distinction allows for the creation of larger modular systems uh, that mix uh, free and open source software um, with proprietary licensed uh, um, uh, technology. Um, an example of static and dynamic linking, um, just this distinction in the LGPL at work, um, you can't do that, um, but you can dynamically link. Um, the subtleties of how you can uh, uh, use uh, um, LGPL in an enterprise context um, uh, is a slightly complicated topic, but it definitely, definitely can be done. Um, so let me just wrap up by giving a summary of the argument. Um, so uh, point one, it's economically rational to invest in the development of a feature if the benefits to you exceed the cost of developing it. It's a no-brainer. but. Um, it's economically rational to contribute to your feature back to the false project that it's based on, provided that future capital expenditure into development based on the false project gets contributed back into it. And this is, this is, this is where the distinction between uh, um, permissive licenses and, uh, um, and copyleft licenses matter. Um, 
um, a copy left uh, project is more likely to achieve three than a permissive license, um, but a pure copy left um, uh, license is uh, too restrictive for, for, for enterprise use. So the conclusion is uh, use LGPL. That's it. Does anyone? Is there time for any questions, Connor? We'll do one question, and uh, unfortunately, then we'll need to keep going. I think. Thank you. Um, I think, as you suggested, it's the uh, number of permissive licenses that have uh, given rise to the Apple monster. Um, you say it's a pretty good uh, operating system, but uh, only when it's running on Apple hardware. I mean, that's what it's designed for. Um, very difficult to use on any other hardware. It's the classic case of the walled garden, of course. Um, I'm just wondering if you don't feel a little bit grubby now using one to deliver your presentation. It's not, it's not, it's I know not it's not mine. Your, your presentation <laughs> on free <laughs> software. <laughs> yeah, it's not my laptop, but yeah, um, I, I I completely agree. Sorry, we're going to have to push on, unfortunately, just uh, in, the, in the interest of time. and want to make sure that Kieran's got uh, enough time to talk. So if, uh, yeah, thank you, Robert. That was very insightful. And I think if, you know, if more organizations thought more, more about the, the TCO of open source software and working with it, we'd see quite a different landscape in terms of you know, more adoption and people feeding back. So very, very relevant point. Round of applause for Robert.